So good afternoon. This is Joelle Wright with Trade U, and today we have a very special guest, Ryan Watkins. Uh, Ryan is a senior research analyst at Masari and also writes and records great content. So thank you so much for being here this afternoon, Ryan. Yeah, appreciate you for having me on. Awesome. So the first question that I have is we're seeing a huge rally in the DeFi space right now, which is well deserved and it's very exciting to see. But a lot of people don't really thoroughly understand decentralized finance. So the first question I'd like to get is, can you explain DeFi in simple terms for newcomers to the space and how it works and the concept behind it? Yeah, so I, th I think where we should start is with uh, Bitcoin, just stuff like all builds on top of each other. So at a basic level, Bitcoin is a uh, system for storing and transferring value uh, across the world. Mm -hmm. um, and using this, Bitcoin has created this almost like monetary institution, right? So almost like a central bank, except a central bank that exists as code and whose rules cannot be modified, right? So there will always be 21 million Bitcoin and its issuance is, is predetermined. Now, uh, if you're building a decentralized you know, economy, well, money is just one thing that you start with. On top of that, you probably wanna build a financial system and then some other uh, you know, institutions as well. So that's kind of where Ethereum comes in. And Ethereum is a, it's, Similar to Bitcoin is a, another public blockchain, except it adds this additional functionality enabled by what are called smart contracts. And smart contracts are just like uh, self-executing uh, software that, you know, given a set of instructions will behave according to how it was written. Mm -hmm. And using these uh, smart contracts, you can create, uh, well, a bunch of different financial contracts and using financial contracts, you can create uh, financial institutions, right? If you, there's like, if you believe the theory that uh, corporations are just a nexus of contracts, right? So mm -hmm. um, that is kind of what DeFi is. It's kind of just um, financial institutions that live on a blockchain that have the same principles of decentralization, uh, global accessibility, uh, and kind of like censorship resistant as in they cannot be shut down, uh, just like Bitcoin. So that's, that's very high level and I'm sure we can dive into details as we go on. Nice, that's a great explanation, thank you. So how does Ethereum 2.0 change the way DeFi projects are operating? Will they slowly um, offer longer lockup times or does it affect the protocol in any way? Yeah, so Ethereum 2.0 is this kind of like multi-year transition that uh, well, has been in the works for, I want to say like seven or eight years now. So it's been, it's been, it's been, um, or sorry, seven years now. So it's, it's been a while, like basically since Ethereum first launched. And uh, the first stage of it just launched back in December, mm -hmm. in which a new blockchain that is called the Beacon Chain uh, launched and is now running in parallel to Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Now, this new blockchain doesn't have any applications running on it right now. What's happening right now is it's just bootstrapping uh, its security so that it gets to a point where we are confident that this thing is secure, we're confident this thing works, and eventually you can start building applications, you know, using this new kind of architecture for Ethereum. Um, but in the meantime, we're just stuck with Ethereum uh, 1.0. So as far as like scalability, um, while Ethereum 2.0 will offer scalability in the future by uh, basically splitting up the Ethereum blockchain into subcomponents called shards, uh, which can transact the same level of uh, transactions as the Ethereum blockchain can today. So you're basically just like replicating the Ethereum blockchain in a sense, uh, like 64 times. Uh, and in that way, you'll actually be able to get scalability without uh, sacrificing the Ethereum blockchain being uh, decentralized. So it's easy to run uh, nodes that can support this network and verify transactions and store the data. So yeah, Ethereum 2.0 will kind of uh, promise scalability and more security uh, for these applications uh, when it does roll out. But like I said, that is a multi-year period. And in the meantime, we're stuck with Ethereum 
uh, just one, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of like these layer two scaling solutions, which are kind of like an intermediary stage. Okay, thank you. Um, so can you explain yield farming and the concept behind it? A lot of people are getting into that. Uh, what is what is it and what is the concept? How does it allow you to grow your funds? Yeah, so, uh, so yield farming was this trend that started in the summer mm -hmm. and it was really kicked off by a project called Compound. So Compound is this uh, like kind of like lending protocol that allows people to borrow and, and lend assets. And for a while, it didn't have a token. It was just a protocol that just kind of ran on Ethereum, uh, but there was no token involved. Now in June, uh, they introduced a token. And the reason why they did this is one, they uh, wanted to di distribute ownership to the community and away from the core team. Uh, and two, they want to use this token as an incentive to kind of uh, bootstrap the growth of this uh, lending protocol. Right. So what they ended up doing was they launched a token. They said, hey, uh, if you deposit money onto Compound or if you borrow money from Compound, you will receive not only just like interest from the loans, uh, but you will also receive a token on top of the interest called Comp. So what it created was this opportunity to not only get interest from, say, lending out your money, but also uh, tokens on top of that. So it's like an incremental yield you get in addition to interest. And this kicked off a massive trend in kind of DeFi where a bunch of projects were uh, either launching tokens and then implementing similar programs or um, already had tokens and then implemented similar programs. And like I said, it's to do two things. One, to distribute ownership to a broad community of users, and then two, to kind of like incentivize people to use a platform. So it kind of bootstraps growth. Mm -hmm. Now, from the user's perspective, uh, this creates this thing called yield farming, where now I can go and deposit assets and not only receive interest, but new tokens. So some of the yields that you're getting, so say like you'd get maybe 10% interest. And I mean, that sounds amazing to people who are getting like, you know, 1% in their bank account. Right. Uh, but on top of that, the tokens you're getting were actually making it so that the yield in total was in some cases a hundred or a thousand percent so extremely high yields and this created this entire kind of wave of people just trying to uh you know yield farm these new tokens uh because the yields were crazy i mean if you can go and deposit your money into a, a project and get a thousand percent apy uh that's insane that means you're going to 10x your money in a year so that uh yeah cuffed up a crazy trend Right. I remember that one. It's pretty fun to watch. And so um, basically you kind of included that token thing for the next question. So your thoughts on food DeFi, like yams and sushi, will they see actual use cases for these tokens now that DeFi space is growing? And like you said, they're learning about the lending and things are going um, more towards the person who wants to build the interest. Do you see these tokens as use for the future? Yeah, so it's interesting. So it depends on the token. I mean, there's definitely some kind of like true coins from the summer that uh, were purely opportunistic and they saw an opportunity to just, you know, make money and that's it. Mm -hmm. But there are projects like, you know, one you mentioned is Sushi Swap, uh, which are actually very interesting now. So Sushi uh, kind of launched a token over the summer and they copied Uniswap's code and basically launched a carbon copy of the same Uniswap, wow. uh, but with a new token called Sushi. Mm -hmm. And at first it was uh, kind of like a joke, right? I mean, it's just a copy, there's nothing innovative about it. And it kind of was treated as such. People would just, like I said, they kind of deposit their money into Sushi Swap, they get the Sushi token. And because they didn't believe this thing had any long-term viability, they just dumped it. Now it's completely changed since August when that first launched. Right. Now SushiSwap is actually a very formidable competitor to Uniswap and actually does uh, about 50% of the volume that Uniswap does now. Uh, and mind you, Uniswap has, is doing comparable volumes to the, some of the top exchanges in the world. So SushiSwap is now uh, kind of like a, a DeFi leader 
which is pretty crazy considering this thing launched you know, six months ago. Yeah. And on top of that, it is taking a complete different direction from Uniswap uh, as far as its roadmap. So it's working with uh, Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi community and it, the, the urine ecosystem. Uh, it's working on a, a bunch of new kind of interesting products like uh, lending products and uh, crowd sale products and just a whole range of different uh, projects that you know, Uniswap quite frankly isn't looking at or just doing something different. So um, yeah, it's, it depends on the token, but yeah, there, there definitely is some, some gems that have come out that period. Right. That's awesome. So your best advice for someone interested in using their crypto for DeFi purposes, are there any DeFi wallets that you recommend or exchanges that you personally feel are secure or safer than others? Yeah. So if you want to use DeFi, I mean, MetaMask is a desktop wallet that will allow you to just sign into any DeFi app in a matter of seconds. It's, it's, pretty incredible experience. I mean, assuming you already have assets that you've deposited into your MetaMask wallet, mm -hmm. you can literally onboard to any new application in like 10 seconds. Like you go to a website, you connect a wallet and you're good. And yeah, I mean, as far as like what applications would be good to use to start, I think uh, Uniswap is kind of the leading DeFi application and it's just it's just an exchange, right? So just like Coinbase or Binance, it's an exchange, except an exchange that it lives as code on Ethereum that is, uh, you know, autonomous and no one really owns. And it's a great place to trade because you can literally trade any asset that exists on Ethereum, uh, no matter where you are in the world without having to go through any, you know, weapon use like a VPN to go into some foreign exchange or go through some KYC process and, you know, maybe you're not a citizen of the country, like it's just a much simpler onboarding process for, uh, for traders. Nice. So um, Uniswap as an exchange, you kind of just said how you felt about it and it appears to be growing at a rapid pace and it's been having larger trade volumes in Coinbase. So in the future, we'll probably be seeing this around more and maybe competing with Coinbase, do you think? Uh, it does compete with Coinbase, but I also think they're kind of, uh, competing in, they're also, yeah, I think they're, they're kind of a different market. So Coinbase is bread and butter is trading between fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies. So being able to trade a, a dollar for Bitcoin or a dollar for, for Ether or any DeFi token, whereas Uniswap is all crypto to crypto. So you can't like take a US dollar and kind of like buy, um, you know, a, a cryptocurrency in Uniswap. So, so long as people need to move value from the traditional financial system, you know, from their bank account into this crypto financial system, exchanges like Coinbase will always have a place um, because they, they are kind of like the, you know, the, the portal into this new world or like the kind of fiat on ramps as they say. So yeah. uh, we'll see, I mean, that said like, you can get dollar exposure on a blockchain if you, you know, buy USDT or USDC, which are stable coins that are uh, tracked to price for dollar. All right, perfect. So can you explain gas fees and how they're created and where they derive from? Yeah, so transacting on Ethereum is not free. It has a cost. So every transaction you have to pay uh, some kind of fee. Now that fee is uh, not fixed, it's actually variable. And it depends on how much demand there is to use the Ethereum blockchain. And the Ethereum blockchain, uh, every single block, which is about, let's say 15 seconds, there's a limited amount of transactions that can fit into every block. Mm -hmm. So if it gets really crowded and you wanna get your transaction in, you have to pay a higher transaction fee to get included in the block. So that is what creates this, these periods of time where there's a, a ton of demands use Ethereum and transaction fees as a result go through the roof because everyone is trying to get their transactions in to the next block. 
All right, thank you. And Web3, Web3 is getting ready to play a huge role in DeFi. How do you think it will be extremely important to the future of the internet? Will it be more secure? Will payment portals be integrated into the interface? What is it going to bring to the masses? Yeah, so, so it's definitely one of the less developed parts of this industry so far, um, you know, at least relative to say Bitcoin, Ethereum and, and DeFi. But I think the promise of Web3 is that it is a uh, user-owned internet. And what that means is that users will own their data. They will capture more of the value they create rather than centralized tech platforms, uh, reaping the lion's share of the value that's created by uh, users and content creators. And users will also be able to uh, control how these platforms operate. So instead of it just being, let's say Facebook that decides to kick a certain person off their platform or YouTube doing the same thing or deciding uh, what, how the algorithm works that feeds you your information. Uh, in theory, users could decide that. And that could actually mean that it is a uh, platform that is more uh, neutral and open to people regardless of where they are. And you know, I think that that could be a good thing, right? For users to be able to control their kind of you know internet mm -hmm. destiny, so to say. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. So the top DeFi protocols and tokens you think are going to be around long term, just from personal research. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot, but if I just had to pick five, I would say uh, Ave, mm -hmm. Uniswap. Uh, you're in finance, um, synthetics, uh, sushi swap. Then I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And then uh, to wrap up, I have a question from someone in the group. Uh, it's Michael Abraha from Mount St. Mary's University. And the question is, um, how will platforms like MetaMask and other wallet providers make it easier for people to be onboarded to DeFi platforms? If we have trouble helping people with Coinbase, you can only imagine the, um, the people who will have a hard time learning about MetaMask. So is there some kind of introductory level modules being created or what's going on to help ensure that those people can cross over into the space? Yeah. I mean, I guess we'll have to see with this one because I, I totally agree that it is definitely not intuitive how to how this stuff works. I mean, you can download some, you know, finance app in the traditional financial world, and it's very intuitive how to sign up and and use it. Whereas with this, it takes like there's there's definitely like a a learning curve. Right. So I think maybe some ways are integrating like fiat on ramps into the wallet so that you know, if someone downloads the wallet, it is very easy for them to be able to connect their bank account and then uh, like buy a cryptocurrency that is now in their wallet so they can use. Um, so that's one component of it. And then maybe, I don't think this might not be a job for the wallets themselves, but making it so that the experience of transacting on a blockchain is cheaper because right now, I mean, if you want to do a transaction on Ethereum, it's going to cost you like fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, right. which I mean, it's, it's really insane. I mean, for <laughs> for for most use cases, so uh, I think this the burden of that will fall down to people building protocols, yeah. uh, so being able to batch transactions, being able to use different scaling solutions that may increase the amount of transactions that a blockchain can process. And as a result, lower transaction fees. So, yeah, I mean, there, I think there's there's a there's a ton of work to do as far as yeah. uh, like onboarding people in this ecosystem because, yeah, I mean, that's it's a totally fair point. Like, this stuff is the the UI UX is is not it's not there yet. Yeah, it's not too user friendly if you're not tech savvy or have any back end experience. Well, that pretty much wraps it up. Um, Thank you so much, Mr. Ryan Watkins, for being here today and sharing this amazing insight and great resources you shared. If there's anything else you feel that you want to share, please feel free. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. All righty.